I think I'll put him over here. We happen to have this. Welcome to lecture number four. So we've looked at Haydn, Mozart, Schubert, and today Brahms. And one thing I want to consider before we get to the Brahms is the attitudes of those three composers and then Brahms on teaching and learning composition. Because they all felt that they had to learn continually. The, their whole lives, they felt like they didn't know enough about music. It's particularly amazing with Haydn, who lived much longer than the others. And as we, I think I mentioned this in the first lecture, but Haydn was always practicing composing. So when he wasn't composing a piece, he was practicing composing, which is actually very unusual. And what he did, if you remember, he wrote arrangements of Scottish folk songs, and somebody would come in, various, there were two letters of two observers saying, what are you writing these little arrangements of Scottish folk songs for? And he said, because I learned so much doing this. There are so many possible modulations, you know, and, it, and I, I always need to learn. So that's an extraordinary thing. Mozart, people think of Mozart as not having to really learn the way other people learn, that he just knew everything very quickly. But it's not really true, of course. And uh, in fact, he was slower, if you want to use that term, <laughs> slower than Mendelssohn, who wrote a lot of his great music uh, very young. But here's a comment by Mozart when he wrote his six quartets and dedicated them to Haydn. He wrote on the score, these string quartets are indeed the fruit of a long and laborious study. And he meant it. Because if you look at those quartets, which we have done and probably will again, they are very different from the quartets he wrote before. They're more complex, they're more involved. And when he discovered for himself Bach, the music of Bach, again, you know, all before his death at age 35, he started again studying how to write music with counterpoint and his music became very, very different because of his encounter with Bach. Schubert always felt that he didn't know much he certainly didn't know enough in his own opinion. And he continually sought out teachers of counterpoint who, who in every case, were not as uh, high-level achievers in composition as he at all. But they had a specific thing to teach, and he wanted to know everything about music. And how he had time, like Mozart, but how Schubert had time with all the music he wrote, dying at, before the age of 32, to take lessons from someone is incredible. You know, he took lessons from Salieri. And Salieri was around for a long time. He was around to be a foil of Mozart's, although he wasn't really, just in plays and movies. Um, <laughs> but he was around for a long time, and he also taught quite a few other people. But he taught Schubert. And we know one thing about this that's amusing. When Schubert was very young, a teenager, he was studying with Salieri. And he, he had already started writing some of his songs, Schubert. And Salieri gave him some advice. He said, stop writing songs, especially using German poetry. It's, <laughs> he said, instead, and he gave him some Italian poetry. He said, write Italian opera arias. That is much more suited to you. Oh. So that was a really bad lesson. <clears throat> but Brahms really felt the st stronger than anyone else that he had to study the music of the past and that he didn't know enough. Here is a quote of Brahms that's a very famous one. Neither Schumann nor Wagner nor I learned properly. Talent was the decisive factor. Schumann went the one way, Wagner the other, I the third. Yet nobody actually learned what is right. Nobody passed through a right school. In truth, it was afterwards that we learned. Actually, it was simply a matter of diligence. The more, the one, uh, more for the one, the less for the other. So, he really felt throughout his life that he had to study, and again, it was counterpoint. And he would exchange counterpoint examples with Joachim, the violinist composer, his friend Joachim. And this went all the way through his whole life, trying to improve. And he did improve. His music became, his mature music, which this is a great example of, his mature music became so rich in ideas and so complexly put together that, uh, and by complex, I don't mean complicated, you know, com rich, complex, in a good way. Complicated is, means it's, you know, confusing. This is richly constructed. 
where everything relates to everything else, where everything evolves organically, where he actually had this concept, he didn't know the, the expression DNA because uh, Watson and Crick lived a lot <laughs> later, but his ideas were like DNA because everything that comes in the music that follows his opening ideas comes out of them, even things that don't seem like it at first, and that's what we're gonna look at today. Now, um, Schumann, by the way, felt that the first thing you write is probably the best. This is an attitude some people have. So Schumann wrote, you know, he was bipolar. This is one of the few diagnoses from th that one is, could trust. Going back to, no one talked to him about it. Uh, it. There's a lot of evidence. And he did write huge amounts of music in a short space of time, and then nothing when he was depressed. And then huge amounts of music, like all his songs in one year, and almost all the chamber music in one year, things like that. Well, but Schumann felt and said, um, quote, the first conception is always the most natural and best. The mind may be wrong, but not the feeling. Brahms said, there is no creating without hard work. And then Brahms had a composition to a student named George Henschel, who took a lot of notes from his composition lessons. And this is something that Brahms said to Henschel. <coughs> Let it rest, meaning the music. Let it rest. Let it rest and keep going back to it and working it over and over again till it is uh, completed as a finished work of art until there is not a note too much or a note too little, not a bar you could improve upon. Whether it is beautiful is another matter, but perfect it must be. You see, I am rather lazy, but I never cool down over a work until it is perfected, unassailable. I love that word, unassailable. And you know, it's true with Brahms. You can assail it all you want. <laughs> but you won't break any, every single thing in it. And this piece, we're going to do that. Every piece, every phrase, every idea, every nuance is connected to the previous thing. All comes back to the DNA at the beginning. Um, you know, I was asked recently for a book that I'm contributing to on, on creativity to make a list of the principles of composing. What are some principles that all different styles that all composers might have in common? What are the common denominators? So think about that for a second. It's no fair, I had to think about it for months. But anyway, uh, I came up with a few things. And that this is not about style or period. It's just about some basic fundamental principles that guide most creativity. A sense of newness or surprise. In other words, it shouldn't be an imitation. That's number one. Number two, emotional authenticity. This is a hard one to prove, but for the composer, it should be emotionally authentic, meaning it connects with your inner life and you feel like it's really you doing this, not outside yourself. Now the next ones are, are easier to uh, investigate. Unity, the cohesion of details in the larger structure. In other words, that there is a sense of unity of things being bound together, unless the point of the piece is not to be unified. But it's one or the other. It, but usually the point is unification. And then the other one is precision of expression or economy. Are you saying something with every phrase, with every note? Is, is something happening in each phrase you write? When you look at great music like this, it's true. It's like, it's like a book, too. I mean, how many sentences in a great book are there for no reason whatsoever? Almost none. They always forward the agenda of the, of the writing. Okay, so now let's begin with this piece. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask them, I'm going to continually be asking Michael to jump off the piano bench, but he's, he's ready. Oh, by the way, one more story about composition, because Michael is uh, now teaching composition quite a bit, and we talked about the problem of that. It's a really big problem, because when you teach violin or piano or an instrument, the player knows they want to learn how to do that, right? And if they can't do that, you can show them how to do that better. And you give them an exercise and you criticize them. But if you're doing composition, there's always the problem of what are you trying to say? And is that what you're... So the most famous story that I love about this is Benjamin Britten, who told the story himself, and you can find it in several films. Uh, when he was maybe 10 or 14 or something like that, he was studying with Frank Bridge, the British composer. And Bridge played... I hate to say bridge played a passage, you know, but it was a bridge passage. No, it was a Britain, it was a Britain passage played by bridge. So he played some of his music. And the way bridge taught was he would have the, his students stand 
on the other side of the room, and he would play the student's music. And sometimes he would change it to see if they reacted. <laughs> because he wasn't sure they were paying attention, or he wasn't sure they wrote what they meant, or you know, was testing their ear. But in this case, he played something, and he said, what do you think of that? And Britton said, I like it. And he said, is this what you meant? And he said, yes, it's what I meant. And he said, well, you oughtn't to have meant that. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to teach like that now. But apparently, Britton never forgot that because he felt deep down that it was true. And he was kind of faking it. <laughs> All right, now Brahms didn't fake anything. Let's, let's just hear the DNA, which is actually only four bars long. Let's just hear the opening gesture. And then I'll talk about it for 35 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's the opening. Now, believe it or not, everything in this huge piece comes from there. Now, it seems very simple, but it, it, and the piano is the, is the star of this. Brahms played the piano himself at this premiere. Um, Clara Schumann played the premiere in England. Um, but the amazing thing is the piano, there, if we investigate what Michael just played, and we're going to do that, you'll be prepared for all the themes will come out of it, even though it doesn't seem possible. Mark, let's just hear the piano alone, maybe uh, mezzo forte and a little slower so we can concentrate on it. Now, there are many ideas there, and I think I'm going to have to go to the piano and start talking about this because I don't know how else to explain it. <clears throat> I think I'll use this. First, after the chord, this, already we have two ideas that will become other music. I know this sounds wild, but stick with this because it really is like DNA. You have, this is one idea, and both hands do that, and the next bar, and the next bar, so this, is an idea of the piece, which we don't notice. Then you have, that has the, but if you continue, this is another idea. And so is this. So every little thing gets separated. And then there's this, which also appears here, going up the scale. Instead of uh, this, uh, I'm sorry, or this, this gesture, we have a scale. So one of the ways you hear this is the notes that are not in octaves. Listen. There are only two places where he goes in different directions. So this will become clearer and clearer as we hear the themes. In fact, probably the way to be most clear is to go skip a lot of music and go to the big second theme and show how that connects. So let's do that. Why don't we go to bar um, 30, no, sorry, yeah, 38. We're skipping a lot of music so we can hear how these connections are made. Okay. I hate to stop you there, but it's also fun to do that. Um, so I'm going back over here. Now, how does that come out of the opening? It's not that complicated, but we have in the bass, fall asleep, I'll do it again. We have ba 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 and then da ba ba ba. So if we stop ba 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 and just lower the first note and then there it is. You like that? Are you supposed to hear that? <clears throat> That's a good question. Who asked that? Oh, that was me. Um, <laughs> 
well, after a lecture, you hear it, but the thing is, you, it's the kind of subliminal thing that you feel. That's one of the great things about, about music like this, that you feel it if you're, if you're listening, and you feel that everything is connected. You don't have to know it, but if you come to a lecture, that's the kind of thing that you will know. So, um, aside from that, <coughs> everything else, uh, here, let's, let's, let's go through it now bit by bit. Everything is like that. Everything is mis mysterious and as obvious at the same time as that. So the next phrase, let's start at the beginning and play to the end of, oh, let's go pretty far. Let's go all the way up to where we just started at 38. So let's play up from the beginning to the end of 37. This is a nice big chunk of music. And after we hear this, we'll go back and look at how everything is related to each other. Then the theme, da -da -da -dee, da -da -da. okay, so we got to that, that spot. Now, some of it's obvious, some of it's not, but I, I'll go through that now. <clears throat> so as, as soon as this thing is over, we have an imitation of it in the strings, which then the G, the low note, stays as a pedal, and they play versions of da 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 This is kind of obvious. That's kind of obvious. And the rhythm, though, in the piano of this is syncopated. So it's one ba ba ba. Now, that's important because Brahms was a huge rhythmic innovator. And you know, people, you think of the 19th century, you think of classical music until the 20th century. One talks a lot about harmony and melody, harmony and melody, and form and structure and development. But rhythm is not. Uh, seen as being as, as uh, part of the innovation of that time. But actually, Brahms was an enormously gifted innovator in rhythm. And in fact, he is now thought of as the first modern rhythmic composer because so many things uh, come out of it. So the di displacement of rhythm off the beat is one thing, but the other is the augmentation of rhythm. Now, of course, Bach did things like this. but. This is, once we get through the classical period into the romantic period, it's very different. So we have a new innovator here. So one is the syncopation. And then one, et cetera, off the beat. But what about this thing? What does that have to do with anything? This is a rhythmic variation too. Because remember, you have dam, ba 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 bum. So instead of ba 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 bum, ba bum, ba bum. He's, it's, that's all it is. It becomes obvious, right? Instead of the triplets, da 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 dum, they are now divided into fours, da dum, da dum. But it's still going into the downbeat. So instead of di, da 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 dum, you have yum, ba bum, ba bum, which will become bi ba ba bum. Instead of, okay, you have da 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 dum, ba bum, ba bum. Mm, ba 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 bum, and then bam bam bam. Those things happen. So during the course of the piece, it goes from a triplet to a uh, dotted rhythm, da dum da dum. Again, the same number of notes, and then it goes to off the beat, which we heard already. Instead of ba 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 bum, it becomes here. So that's one two da da da. That instead of 
It's da da di da. Okay, it's a subtle thing, but it's organic. So all these possible shifts of the beat, and the, but it's the same number of notes, this always falling into the bar. And so it is a sense that there is not only key change and new tunes being derived, but there is a rhythmic growth that is also happening. So it really is like DNA in that opening. And in fact, it's almost like a double helix because you've got these two strands of music that, that wind around each other. And coming from everything that is derived, every derivation of every idea in this piece comes out of that opening bar rhythmically or intervallically. And because, by intervallically, I mean, uh, an interval is just a space between any two notes. That's an interval. This is a chord. And within that chord, there are three intervals. And the space between the notes. So when a composer concentrates on just the intervals, it's, it's different than thinking of the whole melody. And he wasn't the first to do it. Beethoven occasionally did it. Bach actually did it quite a lot. But in most music until Brahms, uh, it was more part of a vocabulary that was more uh, common language. With Brahms, more and more towards his late works, he began to focus on taking intervals and develop them, developing them in their own right. And this is what Schoenberg took from Brahms. And this is, and he wrote about it. I mean, it's not, it's not like we had to discover this. Schoenberg owed Brahms, for his, and you can thank him or not, for his development of 12-tone music. But the concentration and the focus on intervals became a whole way of thinking about music post-Brahms. And uh, for a long time, Brahms was criticized in his own time and for a while after as being a, what we call an epigone, which is you know, a, a, a disciple and imitator who's second rate. Because everyone said, well, he's just trying to sound like Schumann or Beethoven or Schubert. He doesn't have his own world. His, his, his style and form is too classical. It goes back. He, he wishes he were Beethoven. The funny thing is it's, there's some truth in it. He did wish that he lived earlier. But what he did, how he dealt with it, has to do with this study of composition. Unlike almost anybody before him, and maybe anybody, he became obsessed with musicology, music history, and he studied Renaissance music um, and early Baroque music and, and early classical music, and he made editions of these pieces. He put out uh, his, his editions of all this music, but he also learned from it, and he incorporated a sense of history into his writing in a deliberate, conscious way. So, for example, this rhythmic thing of bam ba da da dum becoming dum da ti da dum, and also bam ba bing ba bum, and also mm ba ba bum. Those three things come out of Renaissance music, because that way of augmenting and making a, an augmentation of time and, and a diminution of time uh, that was typical Renaissance composition. Uh, it doesn't sound like that. It's completely his own world. But that's, that's the whole point, is that he went back and saw techniques. He mined the past for techniques that he felt could be used in a new language. And by using those techniques, he avoided being an epigone. Not that he ever knew the word epigone. He might have, actually, because he was actually called that in the press. The epigone was originally a, uh, a German word. And it, it appeared in the 19th century uh, in criticism of composers and, and writers. So he probably did know that word, actually. And then it made its way into English. And I noticed, even though it's, it was on my phone, the word, it was not on my dictionary. <laughs> I have this big dictionary printed in 1956. And I looked up epigone, and it's not in there. And it's an unabridged dictionary, and it's about, you know, weighs about 50 times what my phone weighs, if not 100 times, but it's not in there. Anyway, so back to, back to the music. <clears throat> so I, I think... Another wonderful example of how detailed this is, this passage here, um, the piano does this, and then the strings. This is amazing because, yes, you recognize from this, the ba 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 you recognize it, but it's, this is an example of a Schoenbergian thing in Brahms. Why does he do it in this order? Because here we have, because it, it's the right order from the opening of the first notes. We have bottom, 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 
So in other words, and not the last note of each one, but this. Just so you can hear it again. So he condensed it, changed the last note because he needed to connect them, took out the chords, and he just took those da dum ba dum ba dum in the same order and compressed it into one bar. Ba da 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 da. It's incredible. If you're wondering, or if it occurs to you later, let's preempt this. <laughs> Did he know he was doing that? You know that kind of question? I love that question, though, because it allows you to think about the creative process. Um, it's not as easy a question as it sounds. I believe he knew it completely, but not every composer knows, for example, everything that they've done when they're doing it. Because you have to ask what it means to know something. And then you might say, well, they do know because they might know it by ear and sound and not have realized when you analyze it, oh, right, that's, that works perfectly. I had that experience myself once many years ago. Uh, I had written a string quartet for the Brentano Quartet. This goes back a long time ago. And they asked me to give a lecture on it. So I, I didn't prepare because I figured I give lectures all the time. But on my own music, I don't have to prepare. <laughs> this was really a long time ago because I learned the lesson. I showed up with my quartet. And I had an hour. And I said, <laughs> uh, well, let's see. What did I do here? And I, I, started, I analyzed out loud at the piano the first few bars. And I thought, oh, wow, I didn't realize that. Because I had written it, first of all, a while ago, but secondly, I'd written it only in sound, and the logic was all listening. Putting it into words felt very different. So I changed the lecture right there on the spot to, what does it mean to be conscious? <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot easier. No, no, so and I was talking about the feeling of consciousness and, and the levels of, of uh, awareness and lack of awareness and kinds of awareness that you have when you do something. Just like somebody painting or doing a sculpture doesn't always use words to do that. I hope not. I mean, you might, but using words doesn't necessarily fit, right? Um, so when, did Brahms know that? I think in Brahms's case, when he, because we know he said, work hard, do it over and over, keep working on it until you know everything in it can't be changed, can't be improved. There's not one note too many, not one note, not enough. He must have known consciously because there are so many things. Every bar has something like that. Every phrase has two or three ideas that are worked out in great detail. So either he knew consciously or it's the same because he thought so clearly in sound, which is very likely being a composer, thought so clearly in sound that it was the same thing as knowing. But I don't think he would have been surprised I don't think if I said, oh, look, this fits back with that, or this rhythm does that, there would not be any surprise, I'm sure. Um, he was not a good composition teacher, except for George Henschel, because he seemed to like George Henschel. But most people, he turned away. And there are many comments about that. Like, you know, he, one person brought him to his door uh, a score, and he looked at it for a long time and said, where did you get such good music paper? <laughs> That's not so nice. But the most famous comment is some young composer who apparently was quite good and brought him something. And a after he went through it very slowly, looking at it and not speaking, he said, I think you should go on amusing yourself in this way. OK. <laughs> but the other thing we know that he did say in composition, he would cover up the middle voices and only look at the bass and the top, the highest and lowest part. And he said, if that doesn't make sense, to him, now of course this is a, has a lot to do with tonality and certain traditions. If that doesn't make sense, he doesn't care what's in the middle. So that's interesting. Uh, his music is like that. You can hear the ceiling and the floor. Now let's get to uh, another amazing spot. We already heard how that big theme, well, well let's go through it a little bit more slowly and make sure we hit everything. So let's play that theme one more time th that starts at 38 because we know how that works. <laughs> and go up to, hmm. let me see, I better check the time so we cover everything. Okay, let's go up to 
No, you heard that theme. And as, in order to cover everything, let's start at um, seventy-three, and go all the way until letter D, which is one thirteen. And the re I've skipped some music, but we have actually covered in this discussion what you'll hear there. So I want to get to some things that are newish. <clears throat> okay. Okay, great. Now, maybe you heard a lot in there, right? Uh, but I'll bring some of it out. Um, some things are obvious and some are not. But right where they started, uh, I had mentioned that da 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 tam became da tam da tam and became di da da tam, and here is where it becomes da da dum. So that, that's clear. But then we had two things happening at the same time, one slowed down and one at the same tempo. The piano is doing what we know already. Um, it's an extension of it, but we know that material. At the same time, the strings, that comes from, right? But it also, with that B natural, comes from in bar one. That's exactly what happens in the bass. He changed it, but then he comes back to the B natural while the piano is moving forward. So now he is combining two different speeds of the same opening line. Uh, there are many ways to think about this because intellectually it's stimulating. Is it stimulating to listen to? People disagree about that. Uh, I think the more integrity in the context of the piece, the way it's put together, the more extraordinary the music is and the more enduring it is, which is why we still play Brahms, because it's constructed so it is unassailable and the, it holds up. But there were a lot of criticisms of Brahms that have now basically faded away, where he was described, and please don't take this the wrong way, but they said it was like mathematics. That was supposed to be a, a diss. <laughs> His music's like mathematics, it's terrible. Uh, dried up, uninteresting. So obviously people who like mathematics would be, take, be offended because it's, it's far from dried up. It's extraordinary. It's way, the way we know most of the world. But that keeps coming back, and it also goes way back. Bach was accused of being dried up and mathematical. Some people still will say that. I don't like Bach. It's so mathematical. And yeah, where do you begin with that? But that's not anywhere near most of the problems we have now, so it's not so bad. <laughs> And then you also have uh, the criticism of Schoenberg, of course, being that it was mathematical, which is ironic because it isn't really math. As he said once, it's arithmetic. <laughs> okay, but anyway. <clears throat> so then uh, we get this slow, quiet, which also is a slow down version of the opening. It goes up a step, and it's slowed down. 
OK. Then we get a fantastic modulation, which I won't go into now, but it's all based on the rhythm, ba ta ta dum ba ta ta dum Now, we don't need to do modulation because we're talking more about the way the piece hangs together. Then we get a new beautiful theme, and this is great. And while we have it, of course, we have a uh, counterpoint answering in the cello. Could you guys just play that passage one more time, and then I'll take it apart and put it back together. OK, now, you hear that he's playing the opening, right? Dee, da, da, da. Play just your part. That's obvious. This comes from the first bars. Right. Over, and he's playing it over and over. Now, I will sit at the piano. And this part of the tune, well, remember this? Becoming, how about, that's what it is. So first, it was a B natural. Then it was a B flat. Now it's a B sharp. And a C sharp. It's the same notes, B, C, D, over and over, B, C, D, E. B, C, D, E, B flat, C, D, E, B sharp, C sharp, D sharp, E. So he's doing a very modern thing here. He's doing partial manipulations of the intervals. And by manipulating the intervals, he is uh, creating new themes. He's deriving new ideas from just a few notes. And he uses specifically the exact same letter names to, for probably his own enjoyment. B, C, D, E flat. B flat, C, D, E flat. B sharp, C sharp, D sharp, E. It's exactly the same. And because he wants to keep those note names, he has to go to C sharp minor. That's the only way to do it, right? So he goes to a key that is really unusual from C minor, the whole thing goes up. It's easy on the guitar. You just go like that. But it's, you put on a capo, you know, go up a half step. But basically, all the music moves into C sharp minor because he had the idea to take those four notes and create a new concept around them. And in order to do that, he needed to use sharps, and so he had to go to C sharp minor. Um, who knows which came first? And I'll talk about that in a moment. But here, let's look at the tune. So here we have just those notes but it falls back, all right? The next bar only adds one note, okay? The next bar skips a note and adds a note, and then you take the three notes from the end of the previous bar. I'll try to make this obvious by listening. Is that clear? It's much easier than my explaining it, right? I'll do it one more time. And then the last bar, it starts to climb, but goes down and ends on the same note again. Brahms has often been described uh, as his themes like this are related to uh, the um, Ouroboros, the um, snake eating its own tail, the image of recycling that everything gets renewed. It's an ancient image. And he does that both from one idea and a theme to the next, but also the themes themselves are often circular and sort of eat their own tails, just like that. Now, that bar can also be heard as with ornamentation. And I found this sketch that he wrote. But along those lines, it's very close, right? And I do believe that, um, I mean, I'm sure, that 
a lot of songwriters who wrote these classic songs in, in America were the, the music they studied the most to, for grounding in melodic structures were Schubert and Brahms. Um, <clears throat> and it's very well known, especially from some people, who's, one person who said so was Richard Rodgers. Um, and Rachmaninoff. Was, they also studied Rachmaninoff. <laughs> okay, now, the question of this theme, da 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 di da 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 coming out of... Which did he think of first? Because he could have written the opening uh, without this in the bass. He could have just written this instead of this note. He could have left that out. Maybe he put it in after he wrote this theme, but maybe he didn't. Maybe he looked at that and thought, well, I'll just use that. I, I don't know, but I, I did an experiment for you. Um, I worked backwards from a tune to a first idea, just to see if it's possible. Uh, of course it's possible. <laughs> but I took a, a tune that you probably know, and I deconstructed it and wrote something else that sounds like Brahms to see if it could end up in that tune logically, because that's what he does. So let's see if it works. So basically, if you, take, okay, if you take the theme and basically now listen to what I put first, it's all hidden there so that when you get the theme, it feels like a release. Just as rhythm first, fragmented. And now it comes back. to modulate, because there has to be a purpose to each phrase, then it appears. And it feels, ah, it has arrived. Which is to say that working backwards actually works a lot. Most authors do it. You know, they, um, I know uh, my friend I've referred to, the author Ethan Kanan, often writes the endings uh, of things. And then when, by the time he starts at the beginning, when he gets to the ending, he has to change it. <laughs> Which is fine. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense. So let's get through the rest of this because, oh, you know what? I, I want you to play the guys the beginning of the second movement because there's, we're, we're not going to talk about the second movement, but the second movement also, the main theme that it starts with is derived from material in the first movement. So we need to hear that. It's a great little theme. It's the opening of the second movement. And all I'm going to do is compare that to the theme we were just listening to in terms of structure and shape. You heard this. That's the first two phrases. You also heard this. I'll do that again. More goes with, right? Second phrase, da 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 dum, da 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 dee da da. How close is this? 
It's very close. And then ba da da da, and then ba da ba da. The rise. It's exactly the same shape, and it even has some of the same notes. Did he know? He, oh, I love that question. Okay. <laughs> I used to get that a lot uh, a long time ago. I, I, every class, somebody would say, "Did he know that? Did Mozart know he was doing that?" And I'll never forget that because I, I used to think it was a dumb question. And one day I thought, wait a minute, that's not so bad. So I had to write a lot about it to make up for the fact that I acted like it wasn't the greatest question. Okay, now, there's also uh, another idea that we need to, which maybe you'll get yourself how clear it is. Could we hear the music at 141? It's not the first time this appears, but we need to hear it, so. Yeah, okay. Now, this is complicated because it really starts in 140, uh, 140, a bar before. This is really interesting because Brahms does a lot of overlapping, and this is a very complex spot, so it's worth hearing. Not only do the tunes overlap upon themselves, and then sometimes he has two versions of the melody and two different speeds happening, but he also overlaps sections, structures which makes perfect sense. I mean, we know something he couldn't have known, which is when you fly over you know, a, a landmass, you're passing through many places all, and it feels normal, but you're passing over many states or countries or bodies of water. And he intersects things in a way that shows some strange concept. So let's just hear the piano for a moment, alone at 138 going into, uh, let's say, 142 or something. Right, so that, that uh, crashing, that crashing sound is obviously the end of a section, like it was the first time we hear it, and then something new starts. But while he's playing the ending, the strings, can you just play the strings right at bar 140? The strings have started the next section already. They don't wait for him. Okay, now let's go back and do all of this together starting at, uh, let's say, 135. Thank you. And you know, it's kind of dissonant, even to our ears, because the piano starts later, and it's doing the melody in a different key than they are. It, it works harmonically, but it's full of tension. This could have been a lot simpler, but he wasn't interested in that. He was interested in exploring all the possibilities. There's an, a phrase that meant a lot to Schoenberg, and it applies very strongly to Brahms and Beethoven, which is called responsibility to the materials. Uh, Schoenberg used it a lot. The idea of responsibility uh, is something you can say to a kid who's trying to figure out they're really talented and they don't want to practice. And you say, well, you have a responsibility to your talent. Does that work? I don't know, but um, it works sometimes. But the responsibility is there's something else besides you. Now, for a composer, the responsibility to the notes is what we're talking about, to the technique. If you can do something interesting here, don't not do it. Um, in fact, Brahms... Brahms wrote in a letter, I don't have it in front of me, but he wrote in a letter, uh, oh, wait a minute. It might have been Haydn, but it doesn't matter because it's the exact same thought. And they, they, these, these thoughts occur all the time. The idea is, I see so much music where somebody has a good idea and then they break it off and do something else. And he said, nobody needs to hear this. That's the, the gist of it. Um, and the idea is not, with Mozart, yes, he had many, many, many ideas, but every one of them was followed through. And with Brahms, a few ideas contained in, especially as the mature music, a few ideas contained in like a capsule. And then everything is brought to fruition. And that's why something as complex as that, if he knew he could do that and he wanted the canon and he wanted the clash of harmonies, he felt he had to do it. He wasn't going to not do it because he thought of it. So it has to be followed through. 
Now, I think everything you're going to hear will be quite comprehensible at this point. Um, but another spot we might want to hear is, I, do you have letter G, which is bar? Oh. Do you have a letter G? Um, let me see. Where's your scarf? This one? Good guys. They figured it out. OK. Now, what you have here is, play the bass line, uh, please, Michael. OK, you've heard that before. That's right from the opening. That gets explored, and they're not doing it in sync together. And let's hear what he does with that. This is just a, a great spot. Let's, and keep going for a while. So this is the opening, but much more, uh, it's, it's flourishing, it's blooming. And it, he saves this for the ending, of course, because if he gives it away too soon, then we don't have anything to look forward to. Now, before we hear this movement played, I have two things I'm going to do. <clears throat> First, and I warned our trio about this, I'm going to play, I mean, I'm going to read a little passage describing Brahms's piano playing. And, and also Brahms' piano playing of this piece. Um, we were talking, or maybe I was talking to Derek back there, uh, about how Brahms is really a recent figure in some ways. Uh, he died in 1897. Um, he's only two years older than I am now when he died, which really bothers me. <laughs> but um, a lot of people, a lot of musicians, know someone who studied with someone who knew Brahms. For example, I'll give you one very strange example. Gene Drucker, a violinist in the Emerson Quartet, his father studied violin with Brahm Eldring, who played chamber music with Brahms. That's not very far away. Gene, who's my, around my age, his father studied with Brahm Eldring, who as a young man played chamber music with Brahms. So Gene's apartment is full of pictures of Brahms that are photographs from people who knew him. It's not that long ago. So, uh, Clara Schumann had lots of excellent piano students. Fanny Davis, who studied with her, was born in 1861 and died in 1934. And she wrote a lot of uh, material about what it was like to listen to these people play. So she wrote this. Brahms's manner of interpretation was free, very elastic and expansive. But the balance was always there. One felt the fundamental rhythms underlying the surface rhythms. His phrasing was notable in lyric passages. In these, a strictly metronomic Brahms is as unthinkable as a fussy or hurried Brahms. So that's great, the, the expansiveness. Um, if, you're, if you know music notation, <clears throat> when you see this and then this, you know, this is a crescendo, the two lines, and then a diminuendo. Uh, so if you see this on music, you know it's getting louder and then getting softer. But in that period, it was also getting a little slower and a little faster again. It was not only getting louder, it was opening up and slowing down a little and then speeding up. That's something that she mentions right here. This sign, and she draws it, uh, often occurs when he wishes to express great sincerity and warmth. It applies not only to tone, meaning volume, but to rhythm. All right, another few comments. Oh, by the way, uh, Brahms was, they were in uh, England, and he wanted to play the C minor trio, this trio, and they didn't have the music. So Clara Schumann knew that Fanny Davis was around, and she said, do you have a copy? And then she happened to have it. So she gave them the copy, which then Brahms wrote all over, <clears throat> and that's why we have this document. She said, the same afternoon, the master wanted to play his C minor trio, Opus 101, then almost new. Um, let's skip to something interesting. I had brought it with me. Okay, she asked me, if, okay. Madame Schumann asked the master to allow me to listen. She gave them the score and she said, can she listen, it's her score. <laughs> and he growled and grunted his approval. <laughs> um, we know he had a high voice because there's a recording of him talking actually. You can hear this probably on the internet. It goes 
And that's not his voice, that's the recording mechanism. And then he says, this is been Brahms. Herr Doctor, Johannes Brahms. That's it. But they were playing it on an upright piano because that's what they happened to have. It was a little pianino, it's called. And she said, what a picture this was uh, of, of them playing with Clara Schumann turning the pages, exclamation point. Um, and then she says, in the passage which goes into C sharp minor, the passage I mentioned where we get to that very condensed, compressed melody, that that passage, she says, seven bars before the change of key to C sharp minor, I wrote the words, mysterious, always more and more until the pianissimo, but without retardando, without slowing down. In those bars, Brahms, like Beethoven, takes us suddenly onto another plane, and at the beginning of the coda, I wrote the words, tremendous, for it is overwhelming, and Brahms, his colleagues, and his listeners were completely carried away with the magnitude of the idea. Okay, now before we hear them play this, I think I owe you a complete falafel. <laughs> so, uh, uh, if you can't stand the idea, that's just, you know, hold on tight. Now, so what I'm gonna do is remind you how this works. I'm gonna go back to Haydn, Mozart, Schubert, and then Brahms, which you haven't heard. So the idea was, that now that we know quite a bit about the syntax and grammar of how these composers go from one idea to the next, it's impossible to actually do that with words, but I tried. So, first Haydn ordering a falafel platter. I'll be right back. I'll be right back because I enjoyed the falafel platter and I'd like another. The falafel platter was excellent and so I'd like another falafel platter when I come back. I'm back, as you can see, and I would like to have that falafel platter again, please. The falafel platter is excellent and may I come back yet again later for another? Watch out when you toss the raw falafels into the hot oil, it could be dangerous. Oh good, that was close. Haha, ha, no harm done, my friend. Thank you for those falafel platters and thank you for those you will make for me in the future. Thank you very much. See you later. Hey, it's later. I'm back. <laughs> Mozart. <clears throat> this is the hardest one to do. I'd like the falafel platter, please. I'd like the falafel platter. That's the platter, not the pita, please. I'd like the falafel platter that comes with tahini and that's the platter, not the pita, please. I'd like the falafel platter that comes with tahini and that's the platter, not the pita, and it's for here, please. I'd like the falafel platter that comes with tahini and that's the platter, not the pita, and it's for here, so on a real plate, not in a carton, please, and isn't it a gorgeous day out? I'd like the falafel platter that comes with tahini, but could you bring the tahini on the side and that's the platter, not the pita, and it's for here, so on a real plate, not in a carton, please, and don't you agree it's simply gorgeous out today and I'm really sorry you're stuck in here making falafels. I'd like the falafel platter that comes with tahini, but could you bring the tahini on the side and that's the platter, not the pita, but I'd like some pita on the side and it's for here, so on a real plate. What a pleasure it is to come to your store on such a gorgeous day. I'm sorry truly that you were stuck inside making falafel on this glorious day, a glorious, sunny, splendid day to eat falafel. You've made me very happy. Okay, <laughs> Schubert, <clears throat> I'd like the falafel platter, please. Oh, how I'd love the falafel platter. <laughs> It brings me joy even in these sad times. Oh, how I love the falafel platter. But could you pack this up for, I now hear the chimes that call me back to the mill where I must toil. Oh, tis awful until the next deep fried falafel. My fears overwhelm me, the demons fly above me. I cannot escape till death itself sets me free. But now the panic and the fear give way to gentler thoughts of beer. And soon I dream of chickpea batter and my beloved falafel platter. Oh, how I love, how I adore, how I yearn for the splatter of the oil and the taste of the deep fried falafel platter. How I love the falafel platter. It brings me joy even in these sad times. <laughs> okay, Brahms. Uh, Brahms, Brahms. <laughs> This is the concept of developing variation. That's what we've been talking about. <clears throat> I'd like to, I'd like, no, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> the falafel platter, please. Yeah. Okay. I'd like the falafel platter, please. The falafel platter, oh yes, that is what I want. What I want is that falafel platter because it reminds me of home, home, where the falafels are so aromatic. The aroma of the falafels, the aroma of baba ganoush, oh, and the texture. Oh, to be home again where the falafels and baba ganoush are so aromatic, the textures so rich, thick, and creamy. I miss my home, home where the aromas of cumin and coriander linger in the air as my mother cooked falafels day and night. The texture is so rich, thick, and creamy. The aroma of the baba ganoush in the falafel, the aroma of the cumin and coriander lingering, lingering in the air day and night. 
I miss my mother, who cooked falafels day and night. The air thick with the aroma of cumin and coriander. The aroma of my mother's kitchen. The air thick with cumin and coriander. The creamy baba ganoush and best of all the falafels. Day and night, night and day. The air thick with the aroma. Home. Oh yes, I would love the falafel platter. And if you don't mind and it is no trouble, please send one falafel platter to my mother. <laughs> and another to Clara. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Are you guys ready now? OK. <laughs> this is a two iPad, one page turning version of the Brahms. Thank you. 
Gaël. Thank you. Thanks.